The following short story collection is by Dan DeLuise. If you'd like to support him, you can buy him a coffee at the link in the description. These stories are a part of Dan DeLuise's newest scary story collection, Five Minute Frights. Dan is also the author of my recent Halloween special, I Moved to America's Sleepiest Town, which is also available as an ebook on Amazon. Part two of that story will be available in spring 2022. To stay up to date on his writing, subscribe to his monthly newsletter. All the links mentioned will be in the description. The Guest When our babysitter left for college, Mom spent every night making phone calls. She called every teenage girl in town. She called girls in the next town over. She called those girls grandmothers. I would overhear her. The conversations would go well. Then she would say our address. That's when Mom went into full lawyer mode. But it never seemed to work. Everyone knew what happened next door to us. One morning, Mom cornered me in the kitchen before school. What about the Kowalskis? She said. She took a gulp of coffee as she said it. I knew her big merger meeting was that night. She'd been talking about it all week. That didn't make her idea any easier to hear. But their house... It was so long ago, she said. Miss Kowalski used to babysit you, and she takes such good care of Darla. Remember how you two used to play all the time? I nodded. We used to hang out, but that was before the incident. Darla and Robbie would come over and play wiffle ball with us in the front yard. Well, Darla used to play. Robbie would stand behind her and stare at the grass. He was always dressed like it was the middle of winter. Even though the sprinkler was on and my arms were getting sunburned, he looked like he was about to go on a ski lift. He had long, black hair that crowded his face. His eyes always looked gray, even though I knew that wasn't a color your eyes could be. Maybe they were just really, really blue. I'm nine years old, I said. Maybe I don't need a babysitter. Bad things can happen anywhere, she said. I would feel better if someone watched you. I sighed, but mom didn't budge. She was already dressed for work, her hair fluffy and filled with hairspray. I didn't have time to make my case, but if I did have time, I would have made my case. The only bad thing that ever happened anywhere was at the Kowalski's house. When I knocked on the front door, Darla answered. Even though we were in the same grade, I hadn't seen her in years. Her mom started homeschooling her after the incident. I didn't know why anyone would want to spend more time in that house. Hey, Danny, she said. She was standing a few feet behind the screen door. None of the inside lights were on, but I could still make out a sliver of her in the daylight. She was in a white dress with big dirt stains and had waist-long blonde hair. When I last saw her, our hair was the same length. My mom called your mom, I said. I'm going to stay here for a few hours. I could see a second figure emerge in the kitchen. It was Miss Kowalski. She hung in the shadows, waving for me to come closer. As I walked inside, she took a step back. I couldn't see her face. I liked to think she was smiling, but I knew she wasn't. She had her hand against the fridge to keep her upright. Her body curved like a lowercase r. Last time I saw her was a few years back. Her mom and my mom were drinking wine in our front yard, smiling and talking. Yes, yes, she finally mustered. It sounded like she had pebbles in her throat. You can stay. With that, she turned around and walked up the stairs, leaving me alone with Darla. The house had a strange smell, like an indoor swimming pool. The furniture was covered in plastic and the walls were blank their once hanging frames sitting on the ground. All of the pictures faced the wall. I could see the dusty outlines of where they used to hang. Let's go downstairs, Darla said. She had a weird inflection, like she was reading out of a book. As she walked, I studied the way her feet moved. Even her steps felt rehearsed. Just a few hours, I thought. Then I could go home. 
Downstairs, Darla turned on the basement light and guided me through the mess. The back corner was the only section with room to play. It was mostly empty, except for two folding chairs and a lamp. Everywhere else was filled with junk, old couches, televisions, bookcases. As I walked through the wreckage, I saw a pile of clothes with a post-it note on top of it. Robbie was scribbled in pencil. The pile was mostly winter jackets. Do you want to play house? Darla asked. She was standing in the lamplight. I could see more of her now. She was skinnier than I remembered. I could see every joint, every knuckle, every intersection. I wondered when the last time she ate was. When we walked by the kitchen, I didn't smell anything. At our house, the kitchen either smelled like our last meal or our next meal. Their kitchen was empty. The stove was covered with old newspapers. Did you hear me? She said, stepping closer. Sorry, I said. House? Yeah, sure. She smiled. Do you want to play daddy or Robbie? For the first time, it didn't sound like she was reading anymore. This was her real voice. As she took another step closer, I felt a tightness in my chest. It was the same feeling I got when I saw a fight at school or watched a scary movie. Darla grabbed my hand and pulled me under the lamp. She never broke eye contact with me. Her eyes were big and the same gray-blue as Robbie's. I don't know about that, I said. You choose, she said. You're the guest. I thought back to the night of the incident. I was sleeping when my bedroom filled with red and blue lights. I got up and looked out my window. Darla's mom was in the front lawn. She was yanking on her hair and screaming into the grass. Do you have any board games? I asked. You can be daddy, she said. I'll be Robbie. As she picked a ski jacket from the Robbie pile, she told me to sit down on the folding chair. I did as she said. She pushed her skinny arms through the giant coat and picked up something from the floor. It glimmered in the lamplight. When she walked back over, she wrapped her hair into a bun, then coughed a few times, each time making her voice deeper. <coughs> <coughs> <clears throat> she started, I'm Robbie. then repeated, I'm Robbie, I'm Robbie, I'm Robbie. Once her voice was to her liking, she walked behind me with the object in her hand. It was a mirror facing us on the other side of the room. I could see her in it. She was tiptoeing toward me. She had one hand behind her back. In the other, she had a piece of paper. She was reading from it. I offer this to you, Damien. She said. I could feel Robbie's jacket press up against my neck. I could smell something. Maybe it was Robbie, or what used to be Robbie. It reminded me of sour milk. To repay you for all the crimes of my people, she went on, for their greed and decaption. I tried to breathe, but my throat was too dry. Every inhale hurt. After the incident, Mom never explained the situation to me. All she said was that there was an accident. I read the articles on the internet. She told me not to, but I did anyway. Some of them had pictures of their living room. The bodies were all blurred. I could feel the jacket press into me again. Robbie's smell grew stronger. Darla wrapped her arm around my neck. She brought the shiny object to my throat. When it touched my skin, I could feel a pinch of a paper cut. As she pressed harder, the feeling intensified. It was like twisting a pencil point on a sunburn. She moved it across my neck slowly, the pressure traveling from my Adam's apple to my ear. There was a burning sensation along my throat. I couldn't tell if it was bleeding. When it ended, she walked in front of me and lifted her sleeve. Please end the thoughts, my lord, she yelled her voice breaking at the end of the phrase. Her voice moved between her own and Robbie's from deep to bright. As she showed me her wrists, I could see the object more clearly. It was a knife. She glided it softly over her pale wrists. It was serrated along the blade. It looked like there was mud crusted on the handle. She pressed it against her veins. As the first drop of blood ran down her arm, I jumped up. I need to get back, 
I said. I walked backwards through the clutter, tripping on boxes as I made my way for the stairs. She looked up at me and pouted. You're supposed to lay down, she said. Lay down and shake a little. Then stay like that. You're not playing right. I ran up the stairs. As I made my way to the living room, I sprinted for the front door. Darla didn't chase me. I could hear her yelling from her basement, her voice shifting between Robbie's and her own. I was expecting Miss Kowalski to come down and stop me, to ask what was wrong, to maybe make me a snack. But she didn't. She was somewhere up the dark stairs, through the dark hallway, in a dark and sour-smelling room. Outside, I ran for my house. When I got there, I tried the doors, but they were all locked. The sun was dropping below the leafless trees. In the darkness, I could see my neighbors through their windows. Their house lights were all on. I could see them eating dinner or watching TV, silhouettes moving from task to task. They were doing the things houses and people were supposed to do. As the temperature dropped, I folded myself into a ball. I wrapped our welcome mat around me for warmth. I watched the houses. I waited. I ran my hand along my throat. No blood. Every few minutes, I would look back to Darla's house. I was still waiting for her mom, the old Miss Kowalski, to come out and give me a blanket. But she never did. The lights never came on. Even as my mom pulled up and ran to me with her jacket, the Kowalski's house stayed dark. I knew it would be like that for a long time. It didn't matter how much we played pretend. The Stranger In between the tests, I stared out the window. Doctors came through every few hours. They stuck me with needles and stuffed me with tubes. At the end of each visit, I asked what was wrong with me. Each doctor gave me a different answer, but it all amounted to the same thing. No one knew anything. So, I kept looking out the window. It was early fall in New Jersey, the trees vibrant with warnings of winter. St. Elizabeth's Hospital looked out over a playground. I watched kids swing their bodies from bar to bar, unfazed by the miracle of movement. Freedom only mattered to those who didn't have it. As I watched them, I longed for my last night of normalcy. Two friends and I hitched a ride with some older kids to the hiking trail in town. As they sat in the parking lot and drank beer in the bed of a pickup, we wandered into the forest. We didn't have a plan. Dave was the one who suggested fireworks. Ed was on board immediately. None of them knew what to do with the fireworks, but that wasn't the point. When you're 13 and your head feels like a balloon, explosions are the only thing that really makes sense. My window watching was interrupted by a voice at the door. Aiden? I turned to look. The sudden movement sent shockwaves down my back. The woman was half as tall as the doorway with a back that arched above her forehead. She walked cautiously, like the floor would cave in at any moment. She was wearing a robe made of a thin, purple fabric. It ran from the tips of her fingers down to her toes. She sat down next to the bed. Nice to meet you, Aiden, she said. My name is Madame Green. Is this a good time? I nodded. Talking was too tiring. Your Aunt Clarissa called me, she said. She said the doctors reached a stalemate on your condition. She said you needed my help. I looked at Mom in the corner. She was asleep. I was on my own. I'm going to hold your hand for a minute, the woman said. She reached over and laced her fingers through mine. Her hand was cold and sweaty. She leaned over and put her forehead on my knuckles. I knew what this woman was supposed to be. Aunt Clarissa had a knack for finding spiritual healers on Facebook. As she transferred her bullshit into me, I thought back to that night. Dave, Ed, and I walked until the older kids' voices vanished behind us. At night, the hiking trail was too hard to follow, so we made our own path. We pushed through the poison ivy and pricker bushes as we passed around a cigarette from Ed's sister. After a few minutes, we arrived at a clearing. We stood at the tree line and stared at the strange patch of earth. The field swelled in the center, 
and was as big as a football field. It was totally empty except for one tree. It stood tall in the pregnant grass, climbing into the sky like a lightning bolt, its branches stripped of leaves. The bark was charred black. It filled me with a strange, dark feeling. Madame Green's voice took me out of my trance. She sounded upset. No, please, she whispered. Her hand was shaking. She was upsetting me. I closed my eyes. I tried to picture that night again. I don't remember whose idea it was. When you're that age, ideas show up like they had been around for a thousand years. Bad logic strung from teenager to teenager since the beginning of time. We didn't mean to hurt anyone or anything. Stay away from him, Madame Green whispered. I looked at Mom for help. She was still asleep. I wanted so badly to stand up and leave, but I couldn't. My legs didn't work anymore. As of this morning, my upper body followed suit. Soon, my whole body will feel like a bag of mud. Madame Green swatted at the air. I tried to turn away from her, but I was too weak. I stared at the ceiling. Maybe I should have stopped Dave and Ed. When Dave walked to the tree and pulled out the fireworks, I could have recommended a different activity. I could have walked away. I could have tackled him. I don't know. I knew it was a bad idea. Trees were ancient things, and ancient things shouldn't be messed with. But I just stood there. I stood there as they buried the fireworks around the base of the tree. I stood there as they jammed the sticks beneath the roots. I stood there as Ed handed me the lighter. You're the fastest one, he said. You should light them. I took the lighter and nodded. Ed and Dave ran for the woods as I walked around and lit each fuse. As I did, I heard something. Maybe it was the wind. Maybe it was the tree. I can't say for sure. But I heard something. It was a faraway whisper, deep and trembling, like a distant highway. Something was trying to tell me something. The fuses burned down. I made sure to hit each one. Ed yelled for me to run. I dropped the lighter and took off for the tree line. As I dove into the dirt like a soldier, the tree exploded behind me. Purples and reds and yellows lit the sky as a bright line splintered down the trunk. Gunshots echoed. I crawled next to Dave and Ed and we watched as the color traveled through the branches. Then it was over. When the smoke cleared, we saw the damage. The middle of the tree was split in half. When Dave and Ed stood up, I tried to join them, but I, I couldn't. I pushed into the mud, but my legs wouldn't listen. I looked up at the tree. A soft light spilled out from the cracks. Then I felt it. A gradual rumble. The earth was radiating like a grate above a subway. Something was shifting, moving, speaking, transferring. Come on, man, Dave said. He tried to pull me up, but it didn't work. Madam Green ran her hands along my arm. It's here, she whispered. It's in you, it, it's here. The wind pressed against the hospital window. The lights dimmed ever so slightly. A hot sensation ran from my toes to the top of my head. It was difficult to breathe. I felt a stirring in my stomach, a brisk anxiety. I looked around the hospital room. No one knew how to arrived, but I knew someone or something was here. There was a stranger in the room. Madame Green yanked the sheets off the bed. She screamed, which made Mom scream too. She was on her feet before her eyes opened. She yelled for a nurse as she grabbed the old woman. Madame Green let go of my hand and pointed to me. Mom kept grabbing at her, pushing her toward the door. As the nurses spilled into the room, I looked at what she was pointing at. It was the first time I saw my legs since I'd been admitted. At first, I didn't understand. When did I get these scars? When did I get my skin so calloused, so rough, so tanned? When did the soft creases of my knees turn so hard, so immovable? I reached down to touch it. The sensation filled me with horror and nostalgia. I remembered cold mornings cutting down our Christmas evergreen. Long afternoons on the playground climbing cypresses. Brisk spring hikes when I ran my fingers along the trunk of a spruce. 
I remembered the night with Dave and Ed. My toes had morphed together. The bark was traveling up and onto my stomach, freezing me into my forever state. Within days, the wood would travel up my chest, then around my throat, then slowly swallow my chin and mouth and eyes. The days of Aiden were numbered. The stranger was taking its revenge. It was here. It was in me. The Room On the third night Jacob didn't come out of his room, I got the courage to bring it up to Mom. People don't sleep for this long, I said. She was cooking a casserole, the sixth one this week. We were running out of fridge space for the leftovers. But she kept making more. I would watch her from the corner of the kitchen, her posture curved and her newly grayed hair hanging over the food. I walked over and tugged at her sleeve, but she didn't respond. She was slathering butter on the top crust. Mom, I said, did you hear me? He needs his strength, she said. We can't be bothering him. Before I could say anything, Dad walked in. His eyes were red and swollen, but he was smiling. He had three cans of Coke in his hands. I'm starving, he said. I still have the taste of that horrible cafeteria food in my mouth. You would think hospitals had good food for how much money they make, Mom said. I know, right? Dad said. He placed the Cokes on the counter. Mom didn't want us to go near Jacob's room, but I was getting worried. I peered out from the kitchen. His room hung at the end of the hallway like an abandoned lighthouse, the only sign of life being the New York Yankees poster taped to his door. Near the ground, there was a small sliver of space to see if he had turned on the lights. It was still dark, as it had been for the last three days. I turned back to Mom. Shouldn't we check on him? I asked. I don't know why places like Wendy's or Burger King don't put up little shops in hospital. Dad went on. I mean, you have hundreds of people who are stuck for days on end. That's consistent business. It's all politics, Mom said. They sign these big contracts that are impossible to break. Right, right. That makes sense. Right. Dad was standing next to Mom now. His face inches from the casserole. He took a long sniff. <sighs> ah, he said. Smells great. Do you want some of the leftovers while this finishes in the oven? She asked. I think we still have some from yesterday. Wasn't the spinach and ricotta one good? Very good. Very, very good, he said. I couldn't stop eating it. Jacob's going to devour these when he gets the appetite, Mom said. I turned back and took a step into the hallway. The distance between me and his room felt long and narrow, like a high wire. When I got away from the casserole smell, I hit a different smell. It reminded me of old Jim's socks. Even with Mom's array of candles and incense, I smelled it. It cut through everything. The last time I saw Jacob was on the drive home from his treatment. His face was a pale green and his eyes kept rolling back. Mom said I had to keep talking to him to keep his focus. I told him about my friends from school and how they kept pranking the teacher by putting tacks on her chair. It wasn't true. I saw it on a TV show once, but I was running out of material. It didn't matter, though. Jacob didn't even respond. All he did was cough. Pink drool was spilling onto his t-shirt. Danny! Mom said. Why don't you heat up some of those leftovers? We're all craving that spinach and ricotta casserole. I can't stop thinking about it, Dad said. I was dreaming about it last night. I ignored them. I kept my focus on my brother's door. I didn't dream about the casserole like Dad. I kept having a different dream. My brother was running into my room and flicking my ear. It was a game we used to play. We would tiptoe up to the other's door, then wait for our moment. Then the attacker ran in and got one or two good flicks before retreating. In my dream, though, Jacob would run in and flick me, but I wouldn't move. I just stood there. He would flick and laugh, then flick some more. Sometimes he would flick so hard my ear flew off. 
Earth to Danny, Dad said, snapping his fingers in my face. He was standing in front of me, blocking my view of Jacob's door. Do you mind heating up four portions of the casserole in case Jacob wants some? We're going to eat that before this next casserole, because we want to make sure Jacob's able to try it, because in my opinion, <laughs> it was definitely one of your mom's best. I looked up at him and held my eye contact. I couldn't say what I was thinking, so I wanted Dad to feel it. Maybe if I stared long enough, my feelings would translate. But Dad only looked at me for a moment, then away. In that brief connection, though, I saw something I didn't want to see. It was like staring down the tunnel of the world's deepest well. Come on now, he said. He grabbed my shoulders and turned me around. His voice got heavier. You're going to want to heat up each piece individually because if you do them all at once, then you won't get even heat through the pieces and you'll probably have a couple that are too hot and others that are too cold. And then Jacob won't get the full picture of how good these casseroles are. Dad let go of my shoulders and walked ahead of me, but I stayed in the hallway a moment longer. I turned to look at my brother's door one last time. I fantasized about walking up to it and going inside, but I was afraid mom would yell at me. Besides, I never liked going in there. He had a puke bucket next to his bed, which always had pink splatters in it, and there were always clumps of hair on his pillows. Back before the long hospital visit, mom would make me go in there and talk to him, but I always made up some excuse, like I had a cold and didn't want him to get sick. When I couldn't get out of it, I would stay in there for a few minutes and watch him try to breathe. I would tell him about some TV episode I saw, then run back to my room. I looked up. I thought I was walking back to the kitchen, but I was moving toward the door. I didn't want to, but I kept moving, like my limbs were controlled by a puppeteer. I put my hand on the doorknob. I turned. The gym sock smell filled my head like helium. Through the darkness, I could make out a sliver of my brother's face. A soft evening light fell on him. His eyes were open, staring at the ceiling. His arms were straight as rulers and his fingers curled like a blooming rose. I walked to the side of his bed. Red spit fell off his lips. He looked like a frowning clown. I flicked his ear. It was hard. I walked out and closed the door behind me. As I walked back, I seemed to forget what the inside of his room looked like. With the door closed, it could be anything. Jacob could be doing jumping jacks or reading comic books or plotting his next ear flick attack. When I walked into the kitchen, I heated up four plates of spinach and ricotta casserole. When they were done, I wrapped Jacob's plate in aluminum foil and put it in the oven to keep warm. Then, Mom, Dad, and I sat in the dining room and ate in silence. The reflection. The kids circled around me, bumping shoulders in excitement. We were standing on the bank of the Delaware River in the late part of summer. The sky was bright and free of clouds. It was a perfect day to float. Partner up! I yelled. When I gave the orders, the kid ran to their partners, something they figured out over the Camp Pine lunch tables. Within a moment, the circle became a dozen pairings, all except for one girl. Zoe joined the camp the morning of the canoe trip. I'm new to this, she said, shaking my hand in the parking lot. I looked around for her mom or dad, but they had driven off. It wasn't strange for kids to join halfway through camp, but we were already in the last week. As hard as it would be for anyone to make friends in that situation, she wasn't exactly approachable. Her hair was greasy and combed straight over her eyes, and she wore a sort of going to church outfit. On top of that, she was awkward. She didn't talk to anyone the whole ride up. When everyone found their partners, Zoe was left standing there. I reacted quickly. I knew what it was like to be picked last, or not picked at all. Zoe, you can take a kayak, I said. You don't need a partner for that. Zoe nodded, looking neither happy nor sad. Her mouth was a perfect line. As Jack, the other canoe instructor, got the kids in their boats, I walked over to Charles to confirm the pickup time. Charles was the oldest person to work at Camp Pine. 
His stomach slouched over his belt, and his mouth was filled with gray teeth. His job was to drive the canoe van and wait for us at the end of the trip. Even though he was as old as my parents, he liked to gossip about the kids. He'd tell me about the curse words he overheard from the driver's seat, then go off about how kids today needed to be beat. When I walked over to him today, though, he had a strange look on his face. He rested his crossed arms on his belly. Keep a lookout today, he said. A lookout? I asked. He flashed a smile, then leaned in closer. My brother's an EMT and texted me that a girl drowned about 20 minutes north last night. Her mom found a note on the dock and muddy footprints going right to the water. Mom said she was, a uh, depressive. So look for dark clothes. Look for. Right, right, Charles said. Water probably stripped the clothes. Just look for a body. Any body is probably her. Charles wiped the spit off his lips. He was out of breath. She was probably lonely, too, he went on. Anyone who does something as dumb as off themselves probably don't got friends. Loneliness makes you unpredictable. I nodded. I looked over at Zoe and thought about her own loneliness. The way she stood alone and kicked pebbles. I didn't want her to end up like the dead girl. But more than anything, I felt sorry for myself. Even though I'd worked at Camp Pine for three years, I didn't really talk to the other counselors. I ate lunch in my car and watched the counselors gossip and laugh and wrap their arms around each other. I don't know what they said about me behind my back. I didn't like to think about it. Luckily, Charlie included me in on his gossip. Usually I enjoyed it. But his rumors never involved dead girls floating in the river. I turned to look at the water. The trees were swaying softly and the Delaware was a crisp blue. In the distance, I saw a group of tubers drifting in a big yellow clump. They were singing a song I didn't recognize. It seemed strange that a dead girl would be somewhere below all of that. I'll keep an eye out, I said. Charles reached out and shook my hand, as if I had signed a contract. I was on dead girl watch. As he drove away and the campers stumbled onto their boats, I asked Jack to lead the group today. I knew Zoe would be slower than the rest. Jack took the rear, he wouldn't keep an eye on her. There'd be more than a few occasions when campers jumped out of their boats and got into splash wars while Jack was taking the rear. He was easily distracted, usually huddled with a small group of boats, weaving tails from the Jersey shore. While Jack guided the campers down our route, I helped Zoe get into her kayak. New kids always took longer to get ready, but Zoe was especially slow. She acted like she was stepping on a high wire, in another situation, I probably would have just tossed her in and let her figure it out. But she seemed delicate, both in spirit and in fashion choice. By the time she sat down, the rest of the campers were dots on the horizon. You ever do this before? I asked. We were both in the water now, the current pushing us forward. Zoe shrugged. Done what? She asked. Float, I said. You know, two... Kayak, canoe, anything like that? Zoe looked up at the clouds. She stared like that for a long time, as if her thoughts were hiding. No, I don't think so, she said. Just do your best and ask questions, I said. As we dropped her into the heavier current and started to close the gap, I focused my attention back on the water. I'd never seen a dead body before, so I wasn't exactly sure what to look for. Would it look like the dead girl was swimming? Would she look like a log? Or maybe she wouldn't even be floating. Maybe she was clinging to the bottom with the branches and stones and spare tires. Out ahead, I saw Jack wave the kids over to the first big eddy, where we reviewed technique before the second stretch. As the campers paddled to the side of the river, I turned to wave Zoe over. But when I did, she wasn't behind me. Panic fell into my stomach, but it didn't last long. I turned to the right bank, and there she was. I wiped the sweat off my forehead. The stress of the day was already getting to me. Stupid Charles and a scary story. Zoe was safe, floating near a tree. 
She was looking down into the water. I could see her mouth moving. As I paddled upstream over to her, she turned to me with a confused look on her face. It was the first real expression I'd seen from her the whole trip. My reflection isn't changing, she said. She looked back into the water and waved, as if to prove her point. In the distance, I could hear Jack go over the sea stroke. He was doing a horrible job. Zoe, there's no time for this, I said. You're missing the training. Let's... But before I could finish, I looked down at Zoe's reflection. As she leaned over the side of her kayak and waved, her reflection stayed still. Her face in the water didn't change. He looked back at her with quarter round eyes and a mouth filled with mud. In the soft waves, the reflection froze in a bloated look of horror. Look, Zoe said. She put her fingers in her mouth and stuck out her tongue. The reflection didn't follow. See, it isn't changing. It's like a magic mirror. I tried to say something, but I couldn't speak. Like my mouth was filled with the same mud. I grabbed the rope attached to the end of Zoe's kayak and pulled her toward me. Jack's voice was echoing across the water. He asked what I was doing. I didn't respond. I felt a sour feeling in my stomach. Adrenaline hit like a punch in the gut. We needed to go. Now. I pulled harder on Zoe's kayak, but she kept leaning toward the reflection, paddling herself closer. What are you doing? She said. I need to stay. Please. It's magic. She was hyperventilating now. As she sucked for air, her eyes widened. Let me stay, she begged. Let me stay. She looked as scared as the reflection. Zoe, I said. You need to calm. She turned to me. Her face twisted in the same look of horror. Was that real? She said. I thought I was... It can't be. I was just scared and sad and feeling alone. I didn't mean to. I... As we locked eyes, I understood something I didn't want to. I felt her fear and confusion and desperation. We needed to get back to the campers. I used my body weight to yank the kayak closer. I looked back at the other campers. They were turned towards us now, laughing. Even Jack was laughing. I felt shame and fear and embarrassment. Here I was again, the one left behind, the butt of the joke. I had one job, all I had to do was get Zoe to the end of the river. It was the last week of camp, and I couldn't even do that. It's not like I did this job for the friends. I thought I was a good leader. I thought I could help these kids. Save them if need be. I pulled again on Zoe's kayak, but this time it came to me easily. When I looked back, the water was calm. The breeze was soft and warm. I looked down at my hand. The rope I was holding led to my own canoe. All I could hear was the laughter of the other campers. Canoe man Dan's finally had enough of us, Jack yelled to me. He's talking to himself behind a tree. I looked at the empty water. Zoe? I said. But all of a sudden, her name sounded embarrassing, like a high schooler mentioning Santa Claus. As easy as it was to believe she was there, it was just as easy to believe she never was. I looked closer at the still water, and that's when I saw it. Zoe's reflection was still there. Her fingers were crooked and cold-looking, reaching out for air. Her black hair swarmed like Medusa snakes. It was tangled up in seaweed, pulling her closer to the bottom. I rode closer, almost intoxicated. Zoe's eyes were dead in the way a mountain was dead. Cold quiet, but massive. They were staring aimlessly up into the trees, the pupils falling in different directions. Her mouth looked the most strange, like a torn blanket. As I sat and stared, the primal panic came over me. I grabbed my radio and called Charles. I don't remember what I said. My thoughts disappeared as soon as they came. Within ten minutes, there were bright lights and police cars and scuba divers. We got the kids out of the water, and then, next I remember, I was standing in my house. My parents wrapped me in a hug, but I pushed them away. Behind them, the TV was blaring. Zoe's picture was on the news. That night, I sat up in my bed and looked out the window. I got a few texts from the other counselors. They were all new numbers, popping up like meaningless codes. 
I didn't respond. Instead, I looked at my reflection in the glass. My face was warped and distant, but familiar. I put my fingers in my mouth and stuck out my tongue. My reflection replied. I crawled into bed and went to sleep. The rental. I was shivering in the hospital parking lot when I found the Airbnb on my phone. My fingers were numb as I typed cabins and Western Pennsylvania in the search bar. I booked the first result. The cabin was newly renovated and sitting in a huge pocket of green map. It was perfect. I took a long exhale and looked up at the sky. It was dark with shades of purple, a sign of the incoming winter. I turned to look back at the hospital, its lights shutting off one by one. I never wanted to leave a place so badly. The owner of the rental confirmed the booking in under a minute. She sent the self-check-in instructions. Everything would be unlocked. Her icon was a black and white image of two parents swinging a child between them. It was so nice it could have been a stock image. When I hit 76 West, I rolled down the windows and flew up the left lane. I could still smell the hospital on my shirt. It was sour and chemically, but still somehow clean smelling, like a dead body stuffed with air fresheners. When I smelled it, I thought of her face, the way her bones pushed up against her skin like a poorly built tent. As the dark mountains came into view, I took off my shirt and tossed it out the window. After two hours at back roads and snow flurries, I arrived. When I pulled up to the address, I looked around for the real 87 Fairlawn Road. I checked the app in the mailbox, then the app again. From the pictures, 87 Fairlawn Road was supposed to be a sleek cabin with two-story windows. There were supposed to be trees and streams and roaming deer. 87 Fairlawn Road was a shed in the backyard of 86 Fairlawn Road, which sat on a big patch of flat earth. The main house looked abandoned. There were no cars in the driveway or lights on. The roof was half caved in. The lawn was overgrown except for a thin path that led from the driveway to the front door of the shed. I put my home address in the GPS. It would be another two hours of driving. Oh well. 87 Fairlawn Road it is. I grabbed my duffel and walked the path toward the house. The air was cold and bitter rich with the smell of distant campfires. It must be a neighbor, I thought. The smell definitely wasn't coming from the main house. I walked up to the rental's front door. The shed's roof was only a few inches taller than my head. The siding was hanging on by rusty nails and bubbles of white caulk. I took a breath, turned the knob, and pushed. Inside, the first thing to hit me was the smell, like old meat soaked in river water. The only light came from a gas lantern in the corner. There was a rug in the middle of the room, a cot in the corner, but nothing else. No bathroom, no kitchen, no getaway. On Airbnb, the picture showed a newly renovated kitchen with shiny silver appliances in a butcher's block island. The living room was supposed to have a flat screen TV and beanbag chairs nestled next to a sectional couch and three bookcases. The bedroom was supposed to be draped in white linen. The bathroom should have orange soaps and soft towels. None of that was true. I put my bag down and sat on the edge of the cot. I checked my phone. It was 1 a.m. I could go through the process of Airbnb customer service and complaints and getting my money back, but it was late. I could get a few hours of sleep then do all of that in the morning. Besides, where else could I go? By now, mom was probably dead. I didn't want to go back to our house. I didn't want to go back to the hospital. So I laid down on the cot, shirtless and cold. I tried to sleep, but I couldn't. My head was a mess. Mom got sick four months ago. The doctor started by saying there was a chance of survival, but that quickly turned to making plans kind of talk. The cancer started in her lungs and snowballed through the rest of her body. My brother and sister came for a few visits, but they lived across the country. Dad died when I was a teenager. 
It was just me and mom living together in the house I grew up in. After tonight, it would just be me. In the days before she lost her voice, she kept talking to me about heaven. I listened quietly, my face on the brink of shattering. She said that she hoped heaven will let her be a little girl. She didn't want to be old or sick or resentful. She wanted to be eight years old, life totally ahead of her. I agreed that would be nice, then turned the volume up on the TV. When she couldn't speak anymore, the doctor said she could understand me. She just couldn't respond. She would talk with her eyes. They would blink when I said something, sometimes growing wide in laughter or squinting in concentration. Her hands were purple and frozen in a grabbing motion. I think she wanted me to hold them, but I couldn't. If I did, I felt her cancer running through me. My thoughts were interrupted. There was a noise outside. I sat up and went to the window. Outside, the wind ran through the trees, shaking the last of the leaves off of them. It was hard to see, but I could make out a few shadows. Outside the big house, something was moving. The animal walked across the tall grass. It was small, no bigger than a fox. It moved toward the rental, its eyes catching some of the moonlight. It was looking right at me. As it crawled closer, something strange happened. It stood up. It kept moving toward me, only this time upright. I tried to breathe, but my lungs felt deflated. The closer it came, the more human it seemed. But not an adult human. It was barely taller than my car. Then I heard its voice. Hello? It was a young girl's voice, shrill and unsure of itself. Jimmy? She said. Are you there? I crouched down, only my eyes above the windowsill. The girl walked over and placed her hand on my car. She petted the side mirror, like it was the family dog. Is that you, dear? Maybe the girl was the daughter of the host. Maybe this was some prank. They turn off the lights of the house and send the daughter to spook the guests. But the reviews didn't mention it. In fact, there weren't any reviews. I reached for my phone. I needed to contact the host. I couldn't wait until morning. Not only was it false advertising, but now she was giving out my name to her daughter? I opened the Airbnb app and scrolled through to find the listing, but it wasn't there. My last booking was from three years ago, when mom and I went to the beach for a Labor Day weekend. I looked at my banking app. No money had been taken out. Lost in my phone, I didn't realize the girl stopped talking. I looked up to see if she had left. When I lifted my head, my body reacted before I knew what was happening. I crashed onto the cement floor. She was inches from the window, her mouth bent in an almost smile. She was staring into the window, but didn't see me. She was looking at her own reflection, fascinated by it. She had long, blonde white hair and gray-blue eyes, just like mom's. Her face was skinny in a deprived sort of way. You were just here, Jimmy. Where did you go? I laid on the floor and watched her watch her reflection. As I stared, she seemed more familiar. I remembered a framed photo hanging in our living room. It was mom and her siblings from when they were kids. They were standing at the foot of their staircase, their smiles forced and inconsistent. Wasn't I the cutest kid? Mom would say, pointing to the girl at the bottom of the stairs. The girl in the window looked like her, but not exactly. It was a funhouse mirror version, a girl who had gone through a long and horrible journey. The wind picked up, tacking the walls. I felt wholly alone. The closest town was 20 minutes away. There wasn't a streetlight for miles. If I screamed, only the girl would hear. I checked my phone again. No service. The girl tapped on the window. Her face was somewhere between confused and excited, like she was trying to solve a riddle. I closed my eyes, but when I did, I saw my mom. She was laying in a dark hospital room, staring at the ceiling. Her heart rate was dropping. When I stormed out, the doctor grabbed my arm and said she only had a few hours left. He asked if I was sure I wanted to leave. I didn't respond. I pushed him aside and ran for the parking lot. I didn't want to watch her die. I didn't want to see her slip into that other place. 
that place of strange houses and dark corners and body-shaped shadows. The girl sang her mantra as she scratched at the glass. Where did you go? Her voice grew louder, almost yelling. Where did you go? I crawled over to the cot and grabbed the pillow. I pressed my face into it, but the girl's voice cut through. I ripped off the pillowcase and twisted the fabric into a rope. I stuffed each end in each of my ears, silencing her. The girl's voice slowly disappeared. I kept digging. I pushed and dug and hummed meaningless melodies, anything to get the girl's voice away from me. I closed my eyes, but Mom was waiting there for me. I laid on my back and opened my eyes. Dust rained down from the ceiling. The girl was punching the window now, but I couldn't hear her. She was crying, the same way mom used to cry. I laid there like that the whole night. When the sun came up, the girl was gone. I used the cot's blanket as a makeshift shirt and drove back to the hospital. The nurse was waiting with the death certificate. As I signed, she assured me mom was in a better place. I looked at her, my eyes raw and red. No, I said. She's still looking for one. The nurse smiled politely, took the paper and walked down the hall. As she pushed open the swinging doors, a young girl was waiting on the other side. She stared at me from across the hall, her head lowered and eyes raised. I turned and walked back toward the parking lot. I heard the doors open and the girl's footsteps squeak behind me, forever following. The Hunt Dad packed his hunter starter pack. Two Snickers bars, a gallon of water, two protein bars, and a handful of Slim Jims. He was dressed in camouflage with his yellow sunglasses, the ones he bought off the TV. I didn't have the kind of gear he did, so I settled on hand-me-downs from Pat, a camo t-shirt, hiking boots, and tan khakis. In a moment of muscle memory, I texted him to make sure it was okay to wear his stuff. It took me halfway through the message to remember he wasn't going to respond. I put my phone in my pocket and followed Dad out the door. We got in his pickup truck and drove toward our destination. I didn't know where the hunting grounds were, but Dad said they weren't far. Outside, the sun was crawling into the sky, turning the black into shades of purple and red. I didn't know why we had to leave so early. Dad never explained it, and I never asked. We just need to get one thing clear today, right? Dad chewed on tobacco as he talked. What is it? I asked. When we have the shot, we can't hesitate, he said. Yeah, sure, I said. Dad took Pat hunting every year. After each trip, all Dad talked about was how good of a shot my brother was. Personally, I preferred video games and horror movies to sitting in the mud and killing woodland creatures. Mom and I would prepare the post-hunting feast of ribeyes and baked potatoes, which at least earned me some brownie points from Dad. When we hit the highway, Dad took the exit south towards Pittsburgh, which I thought was odd. I didn't know much about hunting, but I knew there were a lot more deer in the Allegheny Mountains than there were by the stadiums. Do we need to get supplies or something? I asked. Dad picked up an old sheets cup and spit into it. Nope. We ended up in Squirrel Hill, just northeast of downtown, which had big colonial houses and a boutique movie theater. Mom took me there once to see Booksmart because it wasn't playing at the Cinemaplex in our town. We ate bunch of crunch and popcorn, our shoulders bumping as we laughed. Dad never went out to neighborhoods like this, though. He hated yuppies. After a few more minutes of driving, we pulled into a hiking trail parking lot. Ahead of us, I could see a neighborhood through the trees. The trail ran along their backyards. We were the only car in the lot. Dad didn't say anything as he went to the bed and grabbed his rifle. I stayed in the truck, waiting for my orders. When it was time to hunt, Dad knocked on my window. I opened the door and followed him onto the trail. I bet you like how quiet the house has gotten, Dad said. I was walking behind him, carefully dodging the sticks he snapped with his boots. Do I like that the house is quiet? 
You're an indoor kid, he said. The house was loud with everyone in it. I loved your mom, but she had opinions about as big as mine. Pat and I mostly agreed, but he was starting to get a mind of his own. Dad laughed as he spit more tobacco into the mud. Ahead of us, the neighborhood was getting closer. I don't like the quiet, I said. Dad nodded as he slipped a bullet into the rifle. I was surprised how close the neighborhood was to the hunting grounds. When I imagined hunting, I pictured men in tree houses on the side of a mountain. No people in sight. Wouldn't people here be scared by the gunshot? I like quiet when I choose the quiet, Dad said. We didn't choose our quiet, did we? I didn't say anything. Instead, I chewed on the inside of my cheek. After a few bites, I could taste blood. I have to live in a quiet house because of another man's decision, Dad went on. Do you know how many times I was drunk in a bar and had the thought of just driving home? I'm not a rich man. I couldn't afford a $20 cab every time I wanted a buzz. But I called one every time. I knew there were moms and kids out on those roads and didn't want their blood on my hands. Dad stopped walking. Is that 411? He asked, pointing to a house. I studied it. In the distance, I could see the mailbox. 411 was written in block letters on the side. I think so, I said. The house was straight out of a James Bond movie. Massive windows, a back deck that wrapped around the first floor, Greek statues... There was a pool and a waterfall in the backyard. Although it was still early in the morning, there was a woman and a kid out by the water. The boy, probably around preschool age, had a remote in his hand. There was a small boat circling in the water. Dad took a knee and lifted the scope out of his bag. He slid it on the rifle. Have you learned about STDs? Dad was whispering now. He looked through the scope and adjusted it. It took him three times to get it right. His hand was shaking. STDs? I asked. Diseases with crazy names getting passed from person to person. Dad said. You have a fun night with a girl and wake up with a fist-sized lip. You know about those, right? I nodded. I looked back at the woman and the kid. She was kneeling down next to him, rubbing his shoulder. She had a big smile on her face. Like this kid operating this boat was the greatest thing ever to exist. She reminded me of mom. You know about that? Dad asked. He was laying on his belly in the mud now. The rifle was pointed to the house with the waterfall pool. Know about what? How diseases can transmit between people. He was getting frustrated. Sure, yeah, why? Pain is like an STD, he said. People give it to each other. If you have a lot of pain in your life, you need to be responsible. Transferring pain to someone is never innocent. Sweat broke out on my forehead. I didn't like the way Dad was talking. It was the same way he talked when he got the news about Mom and Pat. Where are the hunting grounds? I asked. Dad cocked his rifle. The man who owns that house gave us a lot of pain, he said. I looked back through the trees. The pieces were coming together. No, Dad, I said. We need to go home. Did you know that he left the hospital after two hours? What? Mom and Pat are sitting dead in a car, and he's skipping home to his family. Dad said. He only had a couple of bruises. Dad pressed his eye against the scope. Around us, the wind was starting to pick up. The forest was whispering something. A warning from the shadows. We need to redistribute our pain. He said. I never went against my dad. He and I didn't have the best relationship. But there was a silent understanding between us. Stay out of my way and I'll stay out of yours. But there was nothing to be understood here. Dad took a long, slow breath. As he exhaled, I dropped down and shoved the rifle's barrel into the dirt. Hey! He barked, pushing me back. Let's go home! I said. We don't have a home. He said. Dad turned on his side and kicked me. His foot landed hard into my stomach, sending me back into the mud. Please don't do this, I said. I tried moving closer again, but it hurt too much. When I breathed, I could feel the sharp edge of rib puncturing something. I took short, wispy inhales, like a wounded animal. Dad didn't look at me. He kept his focus on the woman and child. 
This is for you, baby doll. The sound of his rifle echoed through the forest. I closed my eyes and buried my face in the mud. As the ripples of the blast softened, I heard a splash. I lifted my head out of the grass, blade by blade. The remote-controlled boat was still doing circles. The woman was looking into the pool, her eyes wide as dinner plates. She stood quiet for a moment. When she finally screamed, her eyes didn't change. The only thing that moved was her mouth. It dropped open like a nutcracker's. The sound was raw, cavernous. As the boat slowed to a stop, the water under it turned brown, then red. Dad took his face away from the scope and cried. It wasn't the way he cried at Mom and Pat's funeral. Those were back straight, tough guy cries. These were different. He wept like a kid who didn't get the right toy for Christmas. Then, as if hypnotized, Dad stood up, wiped the dirt off his overalls, and walked back toward the car. I watched him go down the path, his posture caved in. I wanted to run up and grab him, tackle him, punch in those stupid eyes, but I couldn't. When I tried to move, my body didn't respond. The woman ran back into the house, screaming nonsense. Her cries echoed closer to me. I didn't look away, I, I couldn't. The boy's body floated to the surface. He looked like a forgotten toy, a raft left in the rain. I wanted to vomit. Slowly, the woman's cries disappeared, lost somewhere in the hundred hallways of the mansion. The backyard was silent. I thought about what Dad said about STDs, the way pain moves from person to person. I didn't know if Dad's pain went away, but mine only began to grow. The Visitor Mom keeps the bottle on the top shelf, right out of my reach. I know it's on purpose. I'm not stupid. I've watched the liquid get closer and closer to the bottom. We'll be out soon. These days, mom's at three on and 21 off. It started at 12 and 12, then 10 and 14, then six and 18 and so on. When she's awake, she pretends our life is normal. She toasts a dozen or so egos and leaves them in aluminum foil on the counter. Each morning, I forage through them. I have to be careful though. There's months worth of leftovers up there. Some have fungus spewing up the sides. Sometimes we talk during her three hours, but most times we don't. As soon as she wakes up, she springs from the bed like it's on fire. She doesn't freshen up. Her teeth are beyond saving, and she stopped combing her hair. Not that she could if she wanted to. Her curls are too bunched up. If she tried to comb it, it would rip off like a bad wig. When she leaves her bedroom, she tiptoes down the hallway checking every corner for him. I don't waste my time looking for him or hiding. He always finds me. Instead, I spend my time strategically. When I'm awake, I'm preparing for the night. At school, I spend my time asking kids if their parents have what we need. If they do, I do whatever I can to get it. But the last three weeks have been rough. The teachers caught on to my little game. Now... No one makes eye contact with me. When the bottle was full, Mom gave me small swigs before her dose. It was normally enough for me to make it through the night. For the last few nights, though, she's kept it all to herself. Mom, please, I said, surprising her around a corner. All I need is a sip. My friend James said his dad has a prescription for back pain. We'll have more soon. There was no James. I didn't like lying to mom, but I was desperate. She didn't respond. She shuffled past me, stepping over boxes and piles of clothes. I followed her into the kitchen. She stuffed more egos into the toaster. It coughed black smoke. Mom cursed and slapped it with her hand. Just one sip, mom. Please, I said. Just for tonight, you're young, she said. Moms need medicine. Old people, we're, you know, sick, 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 sick.
sick. Don't you trust me? You know, I'm a... Well, was I? I don't... Don't you watch TV shows? Grey's phlebotomy? <laughs> she laughed, but it sounded like it hurt. I can't keep my eyes closed for so long, I said. He won't leave me alone. Mom looked at me. I hadn't seen her eyes in weeks. Red lines spun into the dark centers. At first glance, I thought they were bleeding. Kids don't... You know... <laughs> Blah, blah, blah. Don't talk back to parents. I, I don't know, she said. Don't you watch TV? Please, I said again. I grabbed her leg. She shook me off like I was a pesky dog. Long day, she said. I'm gonna, um, I lie down a bit. Mom pushed me aside and went into the bathroom. She grabbed the bottle off the top shelf and took a long, healthy sip. I reached up for it, but she slapped my hand. Bad kid, she said, pointing down at me. She furrowed her brow, put the bottle back, then walked to her room. I stood in the hallway and watched her door shut. A frame fell off the wall, joining the others on the floor. I looked at it. It was me and mom, standing outside the hospital, a few months after that, she came home crying, her degrees stuffed in a cardboard box. That whole summer, lawyers sat with her at our kitchen table, running through the details of the surgery. They pressed her on every little detail. How many pills did you take each night to sleep? Were you groggy on the morning of the operation? How was your mental state when the blade slipped? Why did you lie about the cause of death in the report? When the trial was over, she was acquitted. We went to the local diner and ordered cheeseburgers and milkshakes. She barely ate hers. She was in a funk, but I thought it would pass. Then, the visitor came. After mom went into her room, I climbed in bed and closed my eyes. The sun was setting. Outside, cars drove slowly by our front yard. People always paused to look at us. I watched their faces search our windows for signs of life. I knew how it looked. The grass was yellow and overgrown. There was no car in the driveway. The lights were always off. Sometimes, teenagers parked out front and tiptoed toward the front door. One of them would turn the doorknob as the others giggled. Then, all at once, they would scream and run away like our house was a ride at the carnival. Slowly, the sunlight turned orange then red, then pink, then purple. I took a deep breath. I imagined sheep jumping over the moon, like mom told me to. One, two, three. The sheep were fluffy and graceful, casting cloud-like shadows on the craters. It was nice, but I still couldn't sleep. I pulled the blankets up to my chin, and I took another deep breath. I watched TikToks, I turned on the TV, then turned it off again, then on again. The static hum lulled my mind into blankness. But when the true dark came, I turned everything off and closed my eyes. I tried to make my body completely still. Then I heard it. He was breathing. They were rough breaths. At the end of each inhale was a gasp. No air was enough. He wheezed and spit and coughed for whatever he could get, but it was never what he needed. I knew he was next to the bed. I could taste his hot, sour breath. I tried to picture those jumping sheep. Four, five, six. I tried to keep my eyes closed, but my eyelids were starting to spasm. I didn't want to see him. If I didn't see him, maybe I could convince myself it was the wind or a wild animal, or a water pipe. But if I saw him, then I would know. Maybe if I opened my eyes really fast, I could just get rid of the pain. Okay, I can do it. I opened them quickly. He was inches from my face. I closed them again. He was in my brain. His eyes were bulging, and his mouth stretched in a horrified smile, like a child wincing through a sharp pain. 
When he saw me see him, he made a deep, wordless sound. I could feel the noise. It made me nauseous. It was heavy as mud sloshing from his stomach and right into mine. His fingers clutched my arm. I tried to shake him off, but he tightened his grip. His gray-green fingernails grew with each breath, pinching my skin like a pricker bush. I squealed, my lips pressed shut. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. If I opened my mouth, I would taste his spit. With each new groan, acid rain poured onto me. I knew it came from his stomach. That was the organ Mom nicked. Dying. Even with my mouth shut, I could taste his breath. His face was inches from mine. Our breathing was linked. His sense fused onto me like the rot in the fridge. I wanted to kick and punch and stab through his tattered hospital gown. I wanted to do what my mom did to him a hundred times over, only this time on purpose. I wanted to watch the life drain from him. But those were useless thoughts. It was like trying to kill the wind. Instead, I thought about my sheep. Their legs looked like the old man's now, pale and stubborn, struggling to bend enough to jump. They made it a few feet before tumbling back toward the moon. Some got caught in the craters, falling into the dark pockets, suffocating in the atmosphere. Seven, eight, nine. I used my fingers to keep my eyes closed. I tried deep breaths, but my lungs were filled with the visitor's spit. At a certain point, the sheep and the visitor became one. I tossed each one over the moon, but their bodies piled in the craters. I kept counting. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. When I hit 4,433, the sun came up. I opened my eyes. The visitor was gone. In the distance, I heard Mom curse as she slapped the toaster. The Nosebleed I was watching South Park when my girlfriend came home. She tossed her bags into the hallway and huffed a quick burst of anger. At first, I thought she was mad about the state of the house. The Dorito bag was open on the table, crumbs spilling onto the carpet. The apartment reeked of weed. My breakfast and lunch dishes were still in the sink. I'm sorry about this. I managed. I stood up and caught myself in the mirror. My eyes looked like swollen apples. It's not about this, she said. It's that I... I can't even say it. I stared at her for a moment. I couldn't tell if she wanted me to ask a follow-up question. I was the level of stone that made conversation difficult. Ever since quitting my job to be a writer, I didn't have to sit on work calls or interact with anyone. Instead, I got too high to talk. So, my girlfriend coming home early from work was not something I was counting on. I kept looking at her head, hoping she would keep talking. Her hair was up like a beehive and her skirt looked uncomfortably tight. I tried to encourage her to dress more comfortably, but she didn't listen. She worked for a lawyer who made her get him coffee, even though she had a law degree. I guess she had to dress how he liked. To me, that didn't seem like a lot of fun. If I was her, I would have told him off on the first day. But Claire wasn't like that. She worked as long as he wanted her to, on whatever days he wanted her to which is why it was especially strange she was home this early. She sat down at the kitchen table and undid her beehive hair. I could tell she wanted to be alone, but we lived in a one-bedroom apartment. I could have afforded a much bigger place, but we split everything 50-50, so I had to live in the kind of places she could afford. I sat down across from her and tilted my head. She understood what I meant. I lost it, she said. Lost it? My job, I nodded. That's good, I said. Good? You hated him. Maybe Claire could become her own boss, like me. I was going to say this to her, but then I noticed something. Blood was running down her face. She was oblivious to it, staring at the sun. Your nose, I said, pointing at her face. 
This means I lost my health insurance, right? She said. How much does health insurance cost? 400 a month? 500? 1,000? The blood fell a little faster. God, and the job market? She went on. People are applying to hundreds of jobs. Or, I mean, there are hundreds of applicants per job, right? No one is getting a job right now. I'm so lucky. I was so lucky. Her eyes were small and jittery, like those of a wounded animal. The blood kept falling. It curved around her lips and ran down her chin. Watch the rug, I said. It was mixing in with the Dorito crumbs. And what about the apartment? She said. I can't afford this rent. I was barely before. Then groceries, clothes, my car payment. She dug her fingernails into her knees. A sound like a busted windshield wiper. Oh, why don't you take a nap or something? I said. Her breathing got heavier. The inhales were sharp and the exhales were deep. Shuddered. She had her hands on her face. The blood fell through her palms, dropping like lightning bolts down her arms. I should go back, she said, her voice muffled. I should beg, right? I shouldn't have said no. So stupid, I need this job. My father always said, never beg for a job, I said. It makes you look weak. She nodded, hearing me for the first time our whole conversation. Claire could be rude like that. She didn't always listen when I talked. Go lay down, I said. You'll find a new job in the morning. Claire stood up. The blood had soaked her clothes. If I looked at her for too long, I felt sick. She was turning inside out, all of her warmth and energy falling in thin, red lines. I pulled two tissues from my pocket and tossed them her way. They fell at her feet. As she walked into the bedroom and closed the door, I stared at the drops of blood that followed her path. Stress, I thought. Stress was a killer. My dad always warned me about it. We would be on our boat at the Cape, and he would give one of his famous lectures. Life is too short to be stressed, to be sad, to be bogged down by other people's problems, he would say, waving around a glass of 25-year-old Macallan. Those talks were always important to me. They're why I wanted to be a writer. I didn't want to be bogged down by other people's problems. Stress made people crazy. It made your body attack itself. It killed you from the inside out. I didn't want that kind of stress in my life. I wanted to write my own destiny. If only Claire listened to me. When I looked at the time again, it was close to midnight. I guess I was higher than I thought. I stood up to check on her. When I opened the door, the room was dark. The only light came from the moon. It fell across her body. She was lying on her back. The blood now pooled in her open mouth. Her eyelids peeled back into her face. The whites of her eyes now blue. Her hands were by her hip, frozen in a state of gripping. Her hair was sticky with blood, clumped and messy across her face. Her skirt was around her ankles. It looked like someone had stolen her life. I chewed my nails looking between her body and the window. Her face, once fleshy and soft, was sunken and bony, a poorly made sculpture. Blood still dripped off her nose. Our once white Egyptian cotton was pink and brown. I leaned against the door frame. For a moment, I wanted to scream or cry or grab her in my arms, but I didn't. I kept my composure. I took a long, slow breath. I should probably call an ambulance, but that seems like a lot to deal with right now. I wouldn't want the stress to affect me. I needed to be strong for Claire. So, I'm back on the couch now, my brows are open and no sleep, my bong freshly packed. I'm sure she'll be fine. She just needs to relax. The Fortune When I woke up, I pinched my neck to make sure I was still alive. My eyes tried to adjust to the dark, but it was useless. It was an eat-your-face kind of darkness. Pain ran from my shoulders through my lower back and down into my legs. All of my muscles felt like they were going to snap, like I was made out of porcelain. Humans weren't made to stand for this long, but 
in the closet. That's all I could do. There was no room to lie down. It all started when Mom got home from New Orleans. She walked in, still wearing a cheap-looking bridesmaid-to-be necklace. I laughed when I saw her. First of all, my aunt was like 45. Why was she having a full-blown bachelorette party? Second, why didn't Mom get changed? She flew all the way home like that? I said something like, rough night, then went back to playing Rocket League. She walked over and stood between me and the TV. She looked tired, but also kind of frantic. Her eyes were red, but not hungover red. She looked like she'd been crying. I left the match and stood up to hug her. She flinched when I touched her. She pushed me back and asked if I could get some paper towels from the closet. I walked into the kitchen and she followed close behind. I turned back and asked how the trip went, but she didn't answer. As soon as I went in the closet, she closed the door. Then I heard the lock click. I thought it was some weird parenting tactic, something she learned while gossiping with other mothers over the weekend. My aunt always sent my mom these magazine articles that talked about tough love and parents, not friends. But after a few minutes, she didn't open the door. I tried talking to her, but she didn't respond. I yelled, then screamed, then cried. Nothing. I kicked, I threatened, I apologized. I cried some more, but nothing worked. All she did was shuffle around the house, moving things and calling people and yelling gibberish. The first day was the worst. I felt like I was drowning. Between the hunger and the paranoia and the dehydration, I thought my head was going to explode. Then, once I'd calmed down a bit, I started to listen more carefully to the phone calls mom was making. The first one I could really understand was to a pool supply company. For the record, we didn't have a pool. Our townhouse barely had a backyard. She asked the person if they had a list of all the household chemicals that could kill someone. I heard her pull out our crate from under the sink. She lied that she had a newborn and wanted to know what she should lock up. By her responses, I could tell the person on the other end kept repeating, this is a pool supply company. Because then mom would say, I know this is a pool supply company. I know, I know, I know. But you must know a lot about chemicals, right? She said. Please, just help me. I'm a new mom. Please? I heard her sort through the plastic containers. She would grab something, then ask, What about bleach? And after a brief pause, she would say, Great, thank you, thank you. Then I heard her pour the liquids into something else. That's when I started to feel sick. I'd held everything in up to that point, but I couldn't anymore. My stomach was on fire. First, I pissed my pants. The warm, scratchy feeling made me more sick. I managed to get my jeans off before I sprayed shit into the corner. My throat ballooned up to stop from gagging, but it was useless. I turned into the other corner and coughed up bile. Eventually, beyond my control, I leaned back against the shit-covered shelves and closed my eyes. The sleep was short and chaotic. My dreams always ended with me falling down a flight of stairs, and I would spring awake into my pitch-black, foul-smelling hell. Meanwhile, Mom kept making calls. She called a hospital four states away. Hello, Ontario Trauma Center? She asked about all the different ways someone could die from blunt force trauma. What about hammers, remote controls, baseball bats, textbooks? She called a butcher. Which organs do you stab for a quick death? She called a construction firm. Could someone die from a 10-foot fall? What about five? What height leads to paralysis? Hour after hour, day after day, I listened to her. The shit piss puke floor piled up. My limbs felt like broken pencils. Mom didn't need help killing me. I was already dying. By day, who knows when. I wrapped my fingers and prayed. I didn't ask for escape. I just asked why. Why was mom doing this? Our last conversation had been cordial. It was the night before she flew home. I heard my aunt and her friends in the background clearly drunk. Mom said they were going to a psychic for some last minute New Orleans fun and that she would be on the first flight home in the morning. She asked if I was enjoying my alone time and if I spent all the pizza money. It was my first time ever being home alone. 
Finally, at 13, mom trusted me enough to be home by myself. All I wanted to do was make her proud. I guess I didn't. I must have done something bad. Bad enough to die. Just as I dozed off for the dozenth time in my standing grave, I heard mom walk past. She was carrying something big and awkward, grunting as she tried to maneuver it. As she went by the door, she bumped the doorknob. Objects dropped, clinking and clanging. Tiny shadows danced in the light along the bottom of the door. Now was my chance. I bent down, ignoring the horrible pains that shot through at me. I reached through the shit-clogged opening and grabbed whatever I could. Mom screamed when she saw my hand. It was a deep, guttural sound like an animal before slaughter. I grabbed what I could before her foot stomped down. She barely missed my fingers. When I brought the objects into fading light, I took stock of my inventory. There was a toothbrush, toothpaste, a small comb, and a razor blade. I dropped everything but the razor blade. I ran its sharp edge against my fingertips. I didn't feel pain. I felt hope. I saw it at the wood as my fingertips bled. I couldn't feel the pain. A sort of primal adrenaline kicked in, like those mothers who lift cars off their children. Only, in this case, I was pushing off the car Mom had dropped on me. I cut until an opening appeared. Beautiful, fresh sunlight filled the closet. All my aches and nausea scattered like birds. I was one step away from freedom. As I reached through and twisted the lock, I heard my mom from the kitchen. It was a single scream, and then footsteps. By the time she grabbed my hand, the door was already unlocked. With my remaining strength, I twisted the doorknob and pushed. She fell onto the door. I heard her feet slide against the floorboards, desperate to keep me inside. I pushed one final time, and she slammed back into the wall. No, no, no! She cried. Please! Please! I collapsed into the hallway and fell onto my back. It was incredible to lie down. Exhaustion filled my aches. All I wanted was for all this to stop, for mom to love me again. I looked up at her, desperate to show her that it was me, her child. But she wouldn't look at me. Instead, she sprinted toward the kitchen. I somehow made it back on my feet. I caught myself in the bathroom mirror. My cheeks were sunken and my eyes seemed to pop out of my head. I looked like a front yard Halloween skeleton. Every joint pronounced and bent, ready to be formed into something human. I tried to speak, but my saliva was thick as glue. Ma? I managed. I hobbled into the kitchen. When Mom saw me, she looked like she was going to vomit. She cornered herself by the stove and grabbed a knife. She pointed it at me. Get back in there, she said. I stepped closer to her. It was getting hard to see, like driving through the fog. Every few seconds, everything cut out. My chest filled with the irresistible urge to sleep. Ma! I said again. I looked around the kitchen, but I barely recognized it. All the knives and utensils were wrapped in duct tape. The cleaning containers were piled in the corner, empty. On the kitchen table, there were hundreds of sticky notes, each one with a different name and number. They all had check marks next to them. There was writing on the walls, the same phrase, over and over again. I tried to read it, but my eyes wouldn't focus. I just needed to get close to her. Maybe if she felt my touch, she would remember me. Please, I said. It's, it's me. Stay back, she screamed. I was a few steps away from her now. She crossed her arms over her face, and I reached out. She screamed louder. Sound hurt my brain. She crawled onto the countertop and kicked at me. With each movement, she moved closer and closer to the stovetop. Don't be true! Please, God! She cried. Don't be true! I reached out and touched her shoulder. Her skin was soft as rain. I swear, I didn't push her or grab her or, God forbid, strike her. I just needed her to feel me. When I felt her warmth, I started to cry for all the nights of cold and filth and trembling legs. The feeling of skin on skin was immaculate, but the good feeling didn't last long. Her legs kept kicking, swinging along the dials of the stove. Her waist was completely on top of the burners now. When I heard the sound, I knew exactly what it was. 
She didn't hear it. She was lost in her crying. Move! I tried. I grabbed her arm, but she kicked me. I fell back, my shoulders slamming the kitchen island. I got back to my feet and went for the dial. I couldn't reach it, though. I grabbed at her legs one last time, but it was too late. When she felt the fire, it had already climbed up her back. She pushed me aside and ran. Before I could speak, the sleepy, blackout feeling hit my brain like a stampede. I tripped backwards, then was gone. Next thing I remember, I was looking up. The room was filled with bright light. The edges of my vision were blurred, like a dream trying to come to life. The sound my mom made was beyond human. They were screams from another dimension. Her pain was as deep as the ocean, and I could feel it in my own body. She flailed and fought for the surface, but she sank deeper into the unimaginable dark, where skin curled from heat and eyeballs exploded in their sockets. I turned to watch her frantic waltz. The flames had eaten her skin. Her mouth was merely teeth and muscle, biting for words as if they could save her. But they couldn't. Nothing could. She did a few laps of the kitchen and then collapsed into the hallway. The fire climbed the walls. I watched the flames without emotion. It was like walking into a theater halfway through the movie. I could see, but I didn't understand. The dark feeling came back. In a moment, I was asleep again. The next time I woke up, I managed to get on my feet. Instinctually, I went to the sink and turned on the faucet. I drank like an animal. The water filled me with the purest joy. My thoughts were reforming, my muscles singing, my glue mouth turning back into spit. But that happiness was short-lived. As my senses came back, I could smell again. It reminded me of the first days of autumn, when your windows are open and the neighborhood is alive with fire pits. Mom and I used to love that part of the year. The air was crisp and the fires filled every room with a bittersweet, charred flavor. I turned to the source of the smell. The object was half hidden by the hallway. All I saw were what looked to be two burnt logs. Slowly, I remembered Mom and the kicking and the stovetop, but just as easily I could forget those details. My brain was too tired. The dead body was just another thing. When you spend so long in darkness, your brain can lose the ability to feel. Feeling comes from light, from rest, from the taste of fresh air. Those luxuries were dead to me. I smelled a campfire. I tasted charred wallpaper. All I saw in my mom's burnt corpse was a series of atoms, crudely arranged in the improper shape. I wasn't interested in any more pain. I was only interested in answers. I walked to the kitchen table and looked at the post-it notes she left. There were names and numbers for every kind of business under the sun. Next to each number, she wrote the name of a crime. Starvation, poisoning, stabbing, shooting, hanging, blunt force trauma, drowning, etc. She checked off nearly a hundred crimes and the businesses who, she assumed, would know something about them. But more than any other business, there was one. Psychics. Mom had called nearly two dozen psychics. I looked up at the walls. Now I could see the message she had written. She repeated it over and over, covering every inch of space with her penciled markings. The person you love most will hurt you in unforgivable ways. Over and over and over again. I thought back to the last conversation we had. I heard the drunk voices in the background begging for shots. I listened to the distant sounds of marching bands trailing up Bourbon Street. Mom yelled through the noise. We're going to a psychic for some last minute New Orleans fun. I lowered my head. I couldn't look at her frantic writing any longer. I heaved for air. Outside, the spring wind pressed against the window. It sounded like a storm was coming. Mom never liked to open the windows. She always said she paid for air conditioning and heat. Why settle for a temperature you can't control? For my whole life, I understood her logic. But now, the smell of her burnt body was making me sick. I stood up and opened the window. The cold breeze came inside as if it had been waiting. 
I sat down at the kitchen table and closed my eyes. The familiar darkness was comforting. I tried not to think. Instead, I listened to the hiss of the wind. I felt its ice-cold hands wrap around me. I wanted to bathe in that feeling. Wind meant the earth was still turning. That time was still moving. I didn't want to close the windows and pretend I was stronger than the wind. If I didn't know it then, I knew it now. There were certain forces too powerful to control. The Party Upstairs I was 14 when I met the man in the room. It was the summer my mom and I moved from our farm upstate to New York City. After the divorce, my dad fought to keep his house, so we had to move into the spare bedroom of my grandma's apartment. It was a musky building, tucked into a neighborhood at the northern tip of Manhattan, somewhere between Harlem and Washington Heights. It was a hundred floors of bodies piled on bodies, of dark spaces and strange sounds. On the night after we moved in, there was one particular sound that really bothered me. It sounded like a party. People laughing and yelling, all having a great time. My mom was asleep on the twin bed we shared. So I was laying on the floor, staring at the ceiling. After two months of a horrible divorce and two days of moving boxes, all I wanted was to sleep. But I couldn't. The sound seemed to get louder throughout the night. When it hit midnight, I'd had enough. As I walked up the stairs, it quickly became clear that the sounds were coming from the apartment at the end of the hallway. I could see a faint light spill out from under the crack. All the other apartments were dark, asleep. I don't know how the other neighbors didn't complain. As I walked closer, the sound grew louder and louder, like everyone's voice was running through a megaphone directly into my head. When I knocked, I could hear the sounds cut out one by one as if they had been pulled from the atmosphere. As the laughter dwindled down to silence, I heard footsteps walking up to the door. As the doorknob turned, a feeling of regret sank deep into my stomach. What was I going to say? What right did the new guy in the building have to stop a party? But when the door opened, my feeling of regret turned to something warmer, a kind of nausea. The man who opened the door was older, my grandmother's age. He had big puffs of hair that came out of his temples like bales of hay. He looked directly at me, his eyes like a vortex. He didn't speak, he just stared, his lips moving but not making sound, like a question was swimming around his tongue. He had big, veiny hands that hung onto the doorframe. He tapped his fingers against the wood, creating a sound like spiders crawling down the walls. I peered behind him, but all I saw was a dark room. I don't know where the people had gone, but they weren't in the living room. I knew there weren't too many places to hide. I'm sorry, I finally said, stepping back into the hallway. I thought there was a party up here. I couldn't sleep. A party? He asked. His voice was quiet, a scratchy whisper. It was like his vocal cords were made out of strips of paper. Yeah, but it's fine. I said, turning back down the hallway. Sorry to bother you. As I started walking, I could hear him step into the hallway behind me. No, no, please, he said. Come in and meet my friends. We're doing a little performance. I stopped walking and turned around. Outside of his apartment, I could get a clearer picture of the man. He was wearing a white tank top, which wrinkled down around his protruding belly and into his blue jeans. His posture was caved like a crashing wave, his shoulders fat and hairy. In a way, he reminded me of my dad. A performance? I asked. Yes, he said, rubbing his hands together. There's a lot of people from the building here. They would love to meet you. Maybe if my mom was a stranger danger type of parent, I wouldn't have walked inside. But, in fact... She wasn't much of any kind of parent. My dad was a narcissist, a word only uncovered for me after years of therapy. The world was his stage, so my mom never had much of a voice. 
She never warned me about bad people because she never warned me about anything. It wasn't until I walked inside the man's apartment and heard something click behind me that I realized people weren't always good. The apartment was dark, the only light coming from the streetlights and passing cars below. He didn't have furniture or pictures on the walls, only a dozen or so folding chairs and an equal amount of mirrors. The walls were stained with watermarks and sitting on the floor beneath them, there was a series of small machines. They looked like the old answering machines my grandmother still kept from the time before cell phones. I started to get a bad feeling, the same feeling I got when my parents were fighting. I knew I needed to leave, but when I turned around, the man was standing in front of the door, a metal rod in his hands. It looked more like a microphone than a weapon. He placed the tip of it against his lips and smiled two rows of crooked, yellow teeth. Thanks for coming out tonight, he said, looking out across the room of machines. I hope there wasn't too much traffic. The man's voice sounded like the old comedians my grandmother watched, the ones with the swoopy hair. His voice had a certain swinging quality to it, like each word was dancing with the one before it. I should probably go. I said, stepping toward the door. My mom is expecting- I know a lot about traffic, he continued, moving toward me. His eyes grew wider, revealing thick red lines that ran into his pupils. I once waited an hour of traffic. The officer said I should get there quick, but they blocked off the highway. What's that about? I stepped to the side to get a look at the door. There were a dozen locks along the doorframe, all with different shapes and sizes and patterns. I could see a ring of keys hanging off the man's belt. But I waited and waited and waited. Then when I finally got there, all I could see was the car flipped on its roof. When I got out and ran over, all that was left of my wife was her fingers. I saw them reaching out from under the metal. It looked like she wanted a high five! As he said it, he pulled a small remote from his pocket and pressed into it. All of a sudden, the party roared back to life. I grabbed my ears, the laughter piercing my eardrums. It was a different kind of laughter, though. It wasn't sitcom laughter. It was a high-pitched, almost pain-sounding. I spun around to look for the people emerging from their unknown source, but no one was there. All that remained was the chairs, and mirrors, and machines. And my boy, he continued, looking at me. Well, he was about your age. He was flat as a flapjack in the back seat. His guts like a strawberry compote. His saliva foamed up like whipped cream. With each line, the sounds grew louder, as if new people were entering the dark room. Please stop, I said, but my voice was too dry to make sound. Besides, as much as I tried, I could never be louder than those voices. They were deafening. I said the same thing. The man said, pacing in a small circle. Please stop, please stop. I was on my knees in the middle of the highway, my arms raised to the sky like God was going to drop a new family on me. And the pain. Can you imagine? All I wanted was for God to stop the pain, for him to reach down his big goofy hand and swipe me from the earth. It felt like every nerve was getting pricked from my body. As the sounds grew louder, his voice never grew angry. It kept the sing-songy rhythm, the game show host swing, the happy-go-lucky vibrato. As he moved toward me, I walked backwards, my hands in front of me in a weak defense. I should have looked at where I was walking, but I was too focused on what he would do if I turned around. In my clumsy backpedal, I stumbled into one of the folding chairs, my butt landing hard on the metal. That's when he pounced. The man leapt forward, tossing his makeshift microphone into the hardwood and reaching for my hands. I tried to pull away, to collapse onto the floor and enter a fetal position. But the man was surprisingly fast. He wrapped his big hairy hands around my wrists and pulled them behind me. Within a second, I felt the zip tie go around my wrists. The man, as if he had tripped on stage, grabbed the microphone off the ground and straightened his posture. Sorry about that, folks, he said. Anyway, I didn't even go to the funeral. 
Instead, I spent my nights scouring the streets, looking for little bodies, bodies that looked like them, but weaker, more attainable. Bodies I could hold forever. Voices that would never leave. He began to sing an unknown melody. Make you mine, make you mine. I looked around, searching for some sort of lifeline. But all I could see was the mirrors. Each one was perfectly positioned to hold my reflection, turning the empty room into a full house of my terror-stricken face. I tried to scream, but my voice was no use against the others. As I sat and struggled with the hand ties, I noticed where the laughter was coming from. It was pushing out of the small answering machines, as if it had been pre-recorded. And as I listened closely, I noticed something else. Altogether, the sounds formed a symphony of joy, of jeer, and comedy. But individually, they weren't laughing at all. Each and every voice was screaming. I looked around at the man's machine spread out over the apartment. Although my head was aching from the noise, I was able to focus on one of the sounds. The voice was caught in a sort of loop, the words repeating every ten seconds or so. I won't tell anyone. Please, just let me go. I swear I won't. I felt the sick feeling throughout my body. I imagined the old farmhouse, my grandma knitting in her favorite chair, the Mets playing on our old TV. I didn't know if I'd see any of them again. I looked up at the man. He was pacing around the apartment, the microphone still to his lips. He wasn't speaking, though, just mouthing words. He didn't look scared or angry or upset. He looked focused, as if working through the next step of his plan. The plan wasn't important to me, though. I knew my plan. I was going to leave this room alive. And even at 14, leaving places was a talent of mine. I remember a lot about the last night I spent with my father, but what sticks out the most was the way the whiskey felt in my eyes. I tried to rub it out, tried to open my eyes and let the cold cat skills air soothe the sensation, but it only got worse, much like everything else between me and my dad. We were sitting on the porch of our farmhouse. I was drinking Dr. Pepper and my dad was on his fifth glass of whiskey. His drinking followed a familiar pattern. Glass one was friendly, two was curious, three was sleepy, four was aggravated, and five was mean, although according to him, each glass made him funnier. On this particular night, though, he got mean at four and a half glasses. The rest of that fifth glass went right into my eyes. Wake up, he said, tossing the whiskey at my face. Wanna hear a joke? I tried to turn away before it hit, but I wasn't fast enough. My body still ached from moving boxes all afternoon. You could still see the U-Haul from the front porch. My mom insisted I spend the nights leading up to the move out here with him. She said having a father was an important thing and that I should cherish these moments, even though she was the one divorcing him. How do you know if a woman is a slut? He asked me, the words blurring together. I didn't respond. I knew the punchline. Ever since my mom mentioned divorce, my dad had made the same joke each and every night. Ah, uh, he said, shoving me hard with his palm. How? I said. If more people came inside of her than came out of her. <laughs> he said, with a laugh that had more spite than humor. Since you're an only child, he continued on. I guess you know the answer for your mother. I didn't respond. I kept my focus on the mountains, the way they whispered in the dark, their trees all rubbing together. Our house was big and falling apart and sitting right in the mountains' valleys, hidden from other people. I think my dad liked it that way. Laugh! He yelled, throwing me out of my trance. No, I said, standing up from the rocking chair. He stood up too, his big shoulders blocking the front door. Laugh, he said again, walking toward me. His eyes showed no signs of life, just reactions. He was a big room of eggshells. I just had to make it to the other side. I just want to go to bed, 
I said. Before I could react, he lunged at me, his hands landing hard onto my shoulders. I stumbled back a few steps before the porch left from under my feet. As I tumbled through the night and toward the grass, I caught a glimpse of my dad standing there. His chapped lips turned to a smile, his eyes wild, his chest pumping laughter like an overworked smokestack. I saw his face still when I closed my eyes, the automated laughter closing in on me. The man in the room was off in the corner now, searching his drawers for something. I pulled at the zip ties, but they only seemed to get tighter. My hands were starting to lose feeling. I clawed at the plastic, but I knew I was only making myself more tired. When the man found what he was looking for, he walked back toward me. He had one of those answering machines in his hands. He placed it on my lap and stood behind me. We've got a full house tonight, he said looking at the mirrors that surrounded me. To thank all these people just to hear what I have to say? Quite amazing. In the reflection, I could see him bring the metal rod to his lips. Good thing I have some new material tonight, he said. I just love to hear your laughter. He tapped the metal rod on the back of my head. It sent a tremor down my back. Here's a good one, he said. What did the lonely man steal from the funeral home? He leaned over my shoulder, matching my eyes with his through the mirrors. I shook my head. I could see my tears forming before I felt them. My whole face was numb, like it had been dipped in hot wax. Huh? The comedian asked, tapping the metal rod harder against my head. What? I mustered. He stole what was rightfully his, he said his voice booming into a yell. Because everyone wants to steal, did you know that? The government steals, the police steal, the funeral homes steal. Our country wants to take what isn't theirs, did you know that? Huh? Man is entitled to very little in this world, not even his own family. I could feel his breath on the back of my neck. It reeked of old meat, like ground beef was stuffed between all of his teeth. If you want something, you need to steal it! I didn't know what he meant about stealing. I had only ever been the thing stolen. The child taken from his father, watching him watch me from the porch as I drove away. I needed to understand what the man meant. The man walked away from me and paced in small circles in the middle of the room, as if in prayer. As he did, I looked around, searching for clues. What did he mean by stealing? There wasn't anything he could have stolen. All he had was the chairs and mirrors and machines. No furniture, no pictures on the walls, nothing of value. Then I noticed something strange. Painted on the walls were rectangles. Their outlines almost totally faded into the white paint. They were tall, almost human height, and spaced apart like graves. As the man continued to pace, I counted the shapes. Twelve. Then I counted the items, the machines, the mirrors, the chairs. Thirteen of each. I could feel my stomach flip. The sweat fell faster down my neck. Although it was barely winter, the room was terribly cold, like a giant refrigerator. Still, somehow, I managed to sweat, the drops feeling cold and achy as they dripped down my back. Please, I said to the man, his eyes fixed on the floorboards. I, I won't tell anyone. Let me go. The man stopped circling and looked at me. As he walked closer, his voice seemed to grow deeper. All I need is a laugh. Looking down at the machine in my lap. Then, you can go. I looked down at the machine. There was a red dot blinking. I could feel my words sink into the rolling tape, like it was extracting my soul. I wanted to believe a laugh would set me free, but I knew it wouldn't. What about the voices in those other machines? Were they just allowed to leave? As I sorted through my options, the man walked behind me. His scent now caught in my throat. He lowered his chin onto my shoulder. It's easy. Ha ha ha. I could feel my heart like a ticking bomb. I just needed to laugh, then I could go. Be easy, just laugh. Ha ha ha. I mustered my voice like sand. The man whispered in my ear, Listen to the others. 
Listen how much fun they're having. Laugh. Ha. 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 I said. I wanted to vomit. His smell was inside of me, rotting my organs and filling my stomach with acid. No, no, no. He said, shaking his head. He grabbed onto my shoulder, shaking me with each ha. His fingers dug into me like talons. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. His voice stabbed my eardrum. I tried to breathe, but each breath felt further away. I readied myself to laugh. How hard could it be? Laugh, I thought. Just laugh. It's easy. It'll bring you back to your grandmother's apartment with her vanilla candles and big trays of lasagna. Ha! I chirped. But when I saw the man's eyes, I knew it wasn't good enough. In a swift motion, he grabbed the machine from my lap and slammed it into my mouth. It's hard to describe the feeling of your teeth breaking. On the very rare occasion I tell this story to people, I describe it like drowning in an ocean of rocks. The initial punch lit my face with a bright numbness, but no amount of shock could have saved me from the sensation of my teeth entering my esophagus. They fell through my chest like fingernails. Every breath was met with a sharp, burning sensation. That was when I started to scream. It was as if the last 20 minutes of trauma erupted from me, pushing and punching every feeling of panic into the freezing air. I tried to make words, but all I could generate was the animal sound of near death, of the world's eyelids closing in on my small, meager existence. That's when I saw the comedian smile. Good crowd tonight, he said, regaining his posture on the imaginary stage. He moved away from me and the mirrors and walked toward the lines on the walls. I continued to scream, to yell, to exert every ounce of life into the air, but all my sounds fed right into the machine. I tried to spit it out, but it stretched my jaw to the point of contraction, locking me in an embrace with the taste of plastic and dirt. Sometimes, late at night, I can still hear the sound my voice made on that night. It's a firework exploding in the belly of hell. It plays in a loop in the dark of my shitty apartment, circling with the passing car lights and distant gunshots. If I don't pull myself out, I can spend entire days back with the comedian. But, and I remember the silver lining, even as I huffed and spit into the machine, even as my soul got pulled to the place with the others, my brain was ahead of itself. I saw myself in the mirror. I got an idea. I never understood the concept of freedom. People will brag about their freedom, about their independence, how they can do whatever they like when they like, but that's a lie. No one is truly free. Yeah, we're free to explore, free to curse, free to make our own decisions. But the thing about freedom is that all of us, in one way or another, are trapped somewhere. We all have relationships we can't leave, jobs we're stuck in, houses we're forced to pay off. We all have memories on loop. We all have a door with fingernail scratches inside of it, whether real or imagined. Even today, 20 years later, I still find myself in that man's apartment. Even though I found a way out, I still feel like a piece of me is there. As I got my brilliant escape plan, I was fumbling with the zip ties. The man was walking toward the markings on the wall. Sweat was running down his neck, leaving big yellow stains in his tank top. He was muttering something out of earshot. I tried to convince myself that those weren't bodies behind those outlines on the wall. I tried not to imagine them like graves, but my imagination was impossible to control. The man mentioned stealing. He said he stole from the funeral home. Were his wife and son behind that wall? Who else was with them? The man stood in front of the blank section of drywall for a moment. He was swaying side to side, as if caught in some trance. Then, with a quick motion, he would back his arms and thrust his metal rod into the wall. It made a quick pop sound, but it was muffled against the looping machine laughter. As he repeated the motion, I could see the shape start to form. It was the same rectangle that repeated twelve other times. I knew he was going to stuff me in that hole, shoulder to shoulder with the other bodies. 
the ones that held the voices trapped in the machines. My heart felt like a drum roll. I felt sick. I imagined the feeling of insulation all around me, climbing into my mouth and stuffing me with warmth. For a moment, lost in my fear, I forgot about the pain in my mouth from the machine. Felt like I was eating a campfire. Every tooth had its own unique pain. My throat was still clogged with teeth. When I tried to breathe, I would get a single wispy breath before choking on blood. I knew I needed to act fast. As the man tore away drywall, I used my feet to shimmy closer to the mirrors. They were propped up a few feet away from me, but with the loud sound of the machine laughter, you couldn't hear the chair scratch across the floor. I dug my shoes into the hardwood. I caked at the ground. I used every muscle in my legs. I felt like a sprinter in the last moments of a race, pumping away for that moment of escape, of elation. When I got within a leg's length of the mirror, I swung my foot and connected with it. As it fell to the ground, I leapt off my chair toward it. I caught my reflection in the glass before it shattered. My mouth was stuffed with the machine, my jaw wide and broken looking. My eyes were that of an animal, wide and consumed by something, a feeling beyond reason or thought. I was a train barreling toward the end, whatever that end might be. This time the sound of my escape was louder than the laughter. The shattering filled the room. The man whipped around, his hair wild and eyes beady. He looked at me with a look of betrayal, like I had broken our promise. As he walked toward me, I scrambled on my back in the broken glass. I fumbled through the shards, searching for one of the right size. I could feel the edges stab me. They poked holes in my hands and back, slicing me to bits. Still, it was nothing compared to the pain in my mouth. Don't you want to join the party? He asked, a few steps away. I could see something else behind his stretched smile. It was a kind of sadness, an undercurrent. It only showed through his eyes. My boys here, my wife, the girl from down the hall, the delivery boy. You'll be a perfect addition. As I moved from piece to piece of mirror, I found one that felt just right. It was a triangle, perfectly fit for my grip. You'll never be lonely, he continued, leaning down to pick me up. As his hands grabbed my shoulders, I felt that same sick feeling run through me. While he pulled my body off the floor, I twisted my wrist and felt the tension of my zip tie give way. The blood rushed back into my hands, making me aware of every little cut in my arm. I could feel the sharp edges of the glass in my palm. Holding the shard hurt, but it also filled me with another feeling. Power. For the first time in forever, I had a secret weapon. I could take control of the situation. I looked into the man's darting eyes. I didn't want to see what I saw, but I couldn't help it. It was my dad's eyes, watching me from the bedroom he used to share with my mom. They were big and angry, but overflowing with sadness, like his head was a water balloon. The man, the comedian, the kidnapper, he had the same eyes. They were the eyes of a man watching his life leave, falling through his hands like sand, impossible to hold. The man reached toward my face and ripped out the machine. As the cold air hit my exposed gums, I felt the rush of a faint. I almost passed out right there. The pain made me feel like I was pinned to the ocean floor. It's a party here, son. Take care of me and I'll take care of you. You'll be happy for it. The moment happened without my knowledge. Suddenly, I was standing a few feet away from the man, my hand covering my mouth. I could taste the warm, sticky blood on my palm. I pulled it away to look at it. All I saw was red. The shard of glass was gone. I looked over at the man, and that's when I saw it. The piece of mirror was lodged in his neck. The man tried to keep his composure, waving his arms like he was walking a plank. But it was only a few seconds before he was on the ground. He sat there like a kid at a school assembly. His legs crossed, his expression vacant, yet concentrating. He was looking slightly behind me, his half-smile starting to fill with blood. Don't go, he said. His voice was on the edge of laughter, his eyes equally as amused. He collapsed on his back, his focus now on the wall behind him. He was looking at the twelve outlines, the half-finished thirteenth one beside them. It was his audience, his full house, his upright graveyard. It was a reminder of things lost, of things he couldn't quite hold. 
The machine laughter looped as the blood pooled around his neck, soaking his gray hair. As I watched him twist and turn, I felt that laughter closing in. It was descending on him. For a moment, I almost felt sad. Then, like a fever breaking, the feeling went away. I was left with a dark power, an anger brimming on intense joy. I wouldn't be the boy who laughed. I was the boy who left. The next hour moved by me like I was watching it. A movie playing in the background. I grabbed the ring of keys off the man's belt and puzzled through the door's locks. I collapsed into my grandmother's dark apartment, my voice letting off a single scream before I passed out. When I opened my eyes again, the room was bright and filled with paramedics. I didn't pay attention to the news over the next few days. My grandma would play it in the background while I tried to sleep, but I was too focused on just closing my eyes. Every time I tried, they'd shoot open again. My jaw was wired, and my head was a garbage heap of painkillers. All the while, through my bedroom wall, I would hear the newscasters talk about the victims. There were a dozen bodies, each one plucked out of the wall. On one of those nights, I heard my grandma's door open. I recognized the intruder's voice right away. When my dad opened the bedroom door and saw me, he ran over and wrapped me in a hug. As he pulled away, I could see that twinkle in his eye. He wanted to make a joke. I was sure of it, but like a fog dispersing, that twinkle went away. As he looked at me, I saw his darkness. It poured out of him like a ton of wet concrete. It was a version of my dad I hadn't seen in years, like he'd finally exhaled. As he grabbed me in another hug, I could feel his tears on my neck. You're my boy, he whispered. For a moment, I wanted to pull away. I wanted to kick, to scream, to drive something through his neck too. I didn't want to be anyone's anything anymore. But that feeling slowly left the room. I felt my arms tighten around his back, pulling him closer. He had a strange love, an aggressive love, a desperate love, but it was still love. Sitting in my apartment now, typing this for the world to see, I feel a bit of relief, but there are some things I was never able to go back to. I don't go outside much anymore. I like to keep the blinds drawn, the lights off. I don't like music or television or any real sound. I like silence and the dark. I never really speak. I spend most nights on Reddit. I like to stick with no sleep, anything dark, Really? When I come across a meme, I try not to laugh. But on the off chance I do, I always wait a few seconds. I listen to the darkness. I listen for an echo. For another laugh. Or two. Or three. Or twelve. Once I'm sure I'm alone, I tilt my head back and exhale. I remind myself that I got out. I know I did. I left the party upstairs and regained my life. I know I did. Didn't I?